Donald Trump's defense attorneys have come out and they're slamming the prosecutors for defending Judge Chutkin. The government wants to keep the judge on the bench. They love her. She's doing a great job. After all, she's not letting Trump read the discovery and says trial in March for evidence that amounts to 10 or 11 Washington monuments is perfectly reasonable. You don't even need to read the evidence at all anyways. And so we've covered several filings here. We're going to go through and get a quick update on what's happening. But remember, Trump wants Chutkin gone, says she's been biased. He filed originally a request for her recusal. The recusal motion goes up to Judge Chutkin. She gets to review it and then decide whether she stays or goes. And so Trump filed a short opinion, short memo motion, filed nine pages and was asking for her to recuse herself, referencing her own statements from two prior sentencings in which she was, in my opinion, saying Trump was already guilty. Trump, it was out free, she says. And so the government submitted their response. And so we'll take a quick look at that, hit the highlights before Trump wraps this all up with his final report. Apply. And so when the moving party files, they go first, the non-moving party goes second, they get a response, and then Trump gets the final word in his reply, and we'll see what that says. Judge Chutkin going to issue a ruling soon enough. So this is what the motion was from the government in support of keeping Judge Chutkin. So in other words, opposition to Trump's request for recusal. They said there's no valid basis for Chutkin to disqualify herself in this proceeding. They say to support this claim that she should go, Trump cherry picked portion from her sentencings. They picked two different sentencings. They said, no, those were taken out of context. And in both instances, the court was appropriately responding to and ultimately rejecting certain arguments. And so she's saying that they were factually accurate statements from Chutkin. And there was no improper bias at all. And that Chutkin cannot be claimed to have been biased in this case. They say Trump used the wrong standards and that all of this should be denied because it it just wasn't sufficient. Now, this was the government's motion. We read through this full thing previously, so I'm not going to do that again here today. But this was submitted by Molly Gaston. And in conclusion, she says, Judge, we want you. Trump is relying on innuendo to insinuate that there's something sinister happening here in this courtroom. The judge was just doing her job when she was sentencing those other peoples and kind of ranting about Trump. The court's comments, when viewed in context, do not remotely display a deep-seated favoritism. And thus, Judge Chutkin has no duty to recuse herself from this case and Trump should be denied. Now, Trump's defense responded. They get the final word. This is 11 pages and this is once again going to the judge and she's going to decide whether she's biased or not in her courtroom. And I'm sure she's going to give herself an A plus on this one. But here's what this says. United States of America versus Trump, a reply in support of Trump's motion for recusal. Trump's team writing. Your Honor, every defendant in the United States has a right to a trial by an impartial judge who has not not prejudged his guilt or innocence. Judge Chutkin's strongly stated suggestions that President Trump should be charged and imprisoned defy this core principle, and they are sufficient to permit the average person to question her impartiality. Therefore, Your Honor, Chutkin, judge, recusal of you is mandatory. Because our system of justice is based on the reality and the appearance of fairness, recusal is required wherever, quote, impartiality might reasonably be questioned. That's the standard according to U.S. law, 28 U.S. Code 455A. Such is the case here. Chutkin's statements point to the unmistakable conclusion that the appearance of prejudgment, her bias, will infect every aspect of this case and cause the public, us, to rightly question the very legitimacy of these historic proceedings, as we're already doing. The prosecution, for its part, does not seriously dispute that Judge Chutkin made her disqualifying statements, that she was referring to President Trump or that reasonable observers might understand her statements to be a clear prejudgment of guilt. In other words, we know that Chutkin was talking about Trump. She didn't use his name, but we know that's who she was talking about. She's saying that they're not disputing that. And we're not also not disputing the fact that she said something like that. And they're also saying that they're not disputing the fact that a third person might interpret them as being biased. Instead, the prosecution argues that a judge may freely and publicly state that uncharged individuals, like kind of how crazy this is, including individuals who may later appear before her should be charged so long as she does so in a judicial proceeding. So in other words, the judge can say whatever she wants. Why? Because she's in the court of law. It's like, as long as you're in the building, you can do anything because I'm in a courtroom. So if I say Donald Trump should be imprisoned and executed, then she can do that. They say that position is ludicrous and contrary to the law. Obviously that's true. The law requires recusal whenever a judge's impartiality might reasonably be questioned. There it is again. This includes and includes occasions as here where a judge's statement 
statements in unrelated matters, like when Trump was not for Judge Chutkin, when it will likely undermine the public confidence in the judge's ability and willingness to provide the defendant with the presumption of innocence that is guaranteed by the Constitution and fundamental to a fair trial. How could we believe there's a presumption of innocence when Judge Chutkin historically, in prior sentencings, has said there's still somebody out walking free, referring to Trump. Moreover, although the judge's opinions are entitled to some deference when based on a judicial source, the statements here have no such origin. Chutkin made clear that her opinion on potential charges against Trump was just that, an opinion. She said that, and not just a judicial finding of fact based on a briefing and evidence, okay? In other words, this wasn't part of some other determination that she needed to make, okay? She didn't have to come to a conclusion like, well, this defendant did this, and Trump was involved in this, and his own conclusion, this is the thing. It's not like a finding of fact, like, I decide that this person is qualified as an expert or something. This is just her opining. It's not even connected to the case. It's just her making an opinion. This opinion was completely irrelevant to any issue before her. Because of the context of the statements and their obvious meaning, no reasonable person would believe that Judge Chutkin, based on her statements, or based those statements upon anything other than extrajudicial information. She wasn't making statements about Trump's innocence or guilt based on anything before her, and the prosecution doesn't even deny that. Therefore, they say accordingly to the plain text of the law, just read the text, you don't need all this other case law, Judge Chutkin should recuse herself. They go into further argument here. Good stuff. They say intrajudicial statements are not intrajudicial sources. And what the government was saying in their original filing was that this was inside the courtroom, okay? She was talking to a defendant in a sentencing case. And so she's commenting about the conduct and she's allowed to say that. And they said what the government was doing is claiming that was a source under case law, but they're saying that's not true at all. It's a statement. So instead of addressing how the public might perceive Chutkin's statements, the prosecution disingenuously, genuinely argues the following. They say there is a higher standard for recusal based on intrajudicial statements. So the prosecutor went through and they did not like the standard, right? The standard that we said that exists under the law is quite low. If it, you might reasonably perceive. And so they said, oh man, that's pretty low. Okay. Basically, yeah, she seems pretty biased here. Many people might reasonably perceive that she's biased. So I got to go find some case law that tries to elevate that to make it harder to satisfy. So they said that there is is a higher standard and they reference that in their case filing. Now the defense says this is incorrect. Your case law is bad. Your standard is bad. Although the Supreme Court has held that opinions a judge quote properly and necessarily acquires in the course of the proceedings are less likely to require a recusal. It does not follow that a higher standard applies to all intrajudicial statements. So it might happen in some but it's not mandatory for all. What matters is the source of the judge's statements not where she made them. Moreover the law recognizes that under all circumstances, statements that reveal a high degree of favoritism or antagonism require recusal. The public could perceive nothing more antagonistic to a defendant's rights than a judicial opinion prejudging the core issue of guilt or innocence. The cases that the government cites, this is Trump's lawyer, they reaffirm the position. Her cases support Trump's argument and they actually support recusal and they go through and they are giving us some emphasis. And this is all case law that they're referencing. The separation here makes sense. A judge judge who presides at a trial may, upon completion of the evidence, be exceedingly ill disposed towards the defendant. But where that ill disposition does not arise from the defendant's trial or from the functions otherwise necessary to complete the judge's tasks, the statements re indicating prejudgment and bias require recusal. Okay, so if Judge Chutkin had heard evidence about Trump and had come to a conclusion about that in trial based on facts that were presented to her, she could have whatever opinion she wants because she got that opinion from evidence in court. So you can see that, right? If a judge watches, you know, a child abuse case and it's a horrific, disgusting thing as they are, you take a look at that and the judge says, I feel disgusted towards this person. That's fine. You're allowed to do that because you learned about it in trial. But if you're sitting there and you're disgusted about a person because you heard something else outside of trial, that's bad evidence, okay? That is evidence that is not subject to cross-examination. It is fake news. It is whatever you want to call it, but it's evidence outside the court. And if that has prejudged you, if you have become biased because of that evidence, external information, you gotta go. They say here, the disqualifying statements are extrajudicial, by the way. Here, like many Americans, Shutkin watches the news, probably MSNBC, and is otherwise exposed to information that helps her form opinions. Therefore, it's not surprising that the prosecution points to no circumstances whatsoever supporting their arguments that the disqualifying statements from Shutkin are intrajudicially sourced. They also fail, fail to establish that Shutkin has any judicial basis for her repeated suggestion that Trump should be charged. What's her opinion?
opinion on that. Does she have evidence? Is she a prosecutor? There's no basis for it. Respectfully, Chutkin had none. Unlike Judge Justice Scalia's hypotheticals, Chutkin did not previously preside at a trial concerning Trump. So there is simply no judicial basis for her statements. There's no source for it. She's got no basis for it. Nonetheless, in a desperate effort to avoid a mandated recusal, meaning Judge Chutkin has to go, the prosecution government, they quote a handful of sentencing submissions from other cases that never briefed, let alone resolved the question of Trump's culpability. Okay, so they referenced a bunch of other cases where there's other statements. That's fine. It has nothing to do with Trump. At most, certain defendants stated that Trump has some undefined responsibility. These are self-serving and irrelevant statements. There are hardly any sort of judicial information that a court could rely on when forming an opinion. So the judge hearing from these people being sentenced doesn't suddenly give her information about Donald Trump. Here, the statements stand in marked contrast to other types of statements which are necessary that are required in the course of the case. So the defense continues, they say, unable to identify any proceeding where Chutkin could have formed a, an actual legitimate judicial opinion about Trump, the government instead misleadingly argues that Trump has not established the standard. They're wrong. Here's why. First, the statements themselves from Judge Chutkin point to the inescapable conclusion that she formed her opinion from external sources. Here's what she said. Chutkin, I have my opinions, but they are not relevant. Hmm. It makes it clear that her opinions are personal, aren't they? Since they're not relevant and they're not judicial conclusions that are properly and necessarily formed in connection with the judicial duties. Because if they were formed in connection with the duties, guess what? They would probably be relevant, wouldn't they? Because they'd be relevant to what was happening in the courtroom, which would have been about Trump. Obviously it wasn't. Further, Judge Chutkin directly contradicted the prosecution's position here when she stated on the record the following. The issue of who has or has not been charged is not before me. That's right. You're exactly right about that, Judge. It's not before you, so why are you commenting on it? Similarly, Chutkin's statement that President Trump, quote, remains free to this day had no factual or legal relevance to the matter before her. The conclusion was formed, according to Chutkin, based on unspecified, quote, videotapes and footage that the prosecution has not established were in evidence and appear not to be. She says, I see the videotapes, the judge. I see the footage of the flags and the signs that people were carrying and the hats that they were wearing and the garb. Were those on the record in the Priola case? Did they get those submitted? I thought she took a plea deal. So if they're not in the record, what did the judge see? What did she see there? Why did she make those statements in the Priola case if the flags and the signs and the garbs were not even in evidence in the Priola case? It's because the judge is making decisions and opinions based on external evidence. So if that's true, they could hardly support a conclusion that Trump should be charged because that evidence is not in front of the court. Second, the prosecution offers up only rank speculation that Chutkin's statements have come from knowledge and experience that were gained on the bench. That's a fun phrase. There is absolutely no factual basis for that guess, says Trump's lawyers. Amazing. <laughs> what does that even mean? How do you quantify knowledge and experience and then just say that she gets to say whatever she wants because she's gained knowledge and experience on the bench? Okay. Nowhere does the prosecution identify any such quote, you see he's mocking her now, knowledge and experience. Whatever that means. President Trump was neither a witness, a defendant, nor an alleged co-conspirator in any prior case before this court, making it impossible for Chutkin to be exposed to judicially based information that led her to make the statement she said. She couldn't have made the statements based on any evidence that was before her. That's how we know she got it elsewhere. Although Chutkin had to explain the reasons for her sentences, the comments about President Trump were entirely gratuitous and unnecessary because she had to make herself feel better. Further, given the existence of a grand jury in the political environment in D.C., it was conceivable that Trump might appear before her one day, resulting in the appearance of prejudgment. She should have known better. And third, since none of the sentencing memoranda could have provided a basis for her statements, even the people being sentenced, they were not in evidence. They're just sentencing memos. They had no connection to charging decisions in the cases. And so attorney advocacy and un related matters can hardly give an experienced judicial officer the basis to conclude that another individual should be charged in the matter. So saying, look, all these people are, they've already been convicted, right? They've already pled guilty. Now they're just being sentenced. So in the sentencing proceeding, a lot of people are going to be pointing their fingers at everybody else. Of course, they're going to be blaming Trump. Everybody's blaming Trump. Judge, give me leniency. Trump did this. He's responsible for it. But that's not evidence. That's not facts. And the judge knows this is a sentencing proceeding. And this is not evidence that has been submitted in, you know, a trial or an evidentiary proceeding in any way. 
It's just people asking for mercy, essentially, and her just throwing them right in the gulags with everybody else. So they say, in sum, the events of January 6th have been the subject of pervasive news coverage, especially in D.C. No reasonable person could conclude that Chutkin's statements were based on information connected to judicial proceedings, rather than upon the news or other outside extrajudicial sources. Although the court statements may have been intrajudicial, meaning inside a courtroom, the basis for those statements was undoubtedly extrajudicial, came outside the court, saying here that her statements do show prejudgment. They say here, consistent with any presumption of innocence, an impartial court would ordinarily avoid stating any opinion about a third party's guilt until they've had an opportunity to present a defense, but Chutkin couldn't help herself. They had to make these things known, right? They just can't live without it. They say here, her statements are biased as an intrajudicial source doctrine does not apply. So that standard drops back lower. Chutkin should recuse herself if the statements are sufficient to permit. You can ask yourself this is what she said. If you had to mark yes or no, are they sufficient to permit the average citizen reasonably to question her impartiality? That's it. That's like a very simple test. Sometimes legal tests are very complicated with factors and totalities of this and all the things. That's it. And that is referencing federal case. On this issue, the prosecution provides no serious argument, nor can it. Of course, of course you can. A sentencing judge does not call out a non-party who remains free to this day. That's an opinion, except to unconditionally express a strongly held opinion that the person, in this case, Trump, should be charged. Similarly, Chutkin's comments about a defendant who, quote, made a very good point about Trump not being charged must lead the public to conclude that Chutkin thought Trump should be charged. So if you have the plain meaning of what she said, the prosecution argues that she was only making an uncontroversial fact or legal statement, but government cannot escape the conclusion that the average informed observer knows what she said. Chutkin already made up her mind and prejudged Trump. Similarly, the government also cannot ignore the plain meaning of the statement simply because the obvious meaning is implied rather than it's stated directly. So they're saying, well, it's, she didn't say his name specifically. It's like, well, no, there's other case law that shows otherwise. Although an opinion of guilt was not stated literally, other statements about Khalid Sheikh Mohammed were disqualifying. And they talk about the presumption of recusal. Here, the government is attempting to conflate the standards in arguing that Trump has not met his burden. However, the evidence here only needs to meet a clear and convincing standard. It's on the record and it's undisputable. Judge Chutkin made the statements herself. They say the appearance of partiality here, Judge Chutkin being biased, undermines the very legitimacy of this case, if there is any left. The core value at issue here is whether the public is going to accept the proceedings in D.C. against Trump as legitimate. I doubt it. And instead view them as politically motivated by the Biden administration to take out its most significant political opponent in a presidential campaign. The opponent who, by the way, is not only free to this day, oh man, Judge Chutkin is not gonna like that. Oh man. But has a strong lead in the polls. Woo! That's pretty spicy there from these defense attorneys. Okay, so Chutkin said, I can't believe Donald Trump is still free to this day. He's free. You're going to prison, but that man is free to this day. So the defense attorney says, hey, yeah, guess what? Not only is he, by the way, not only free, but he's also leading in the polls. Oh! What do you think about that, Chutkin? So rather than concede as it should, that justice requires recusal, the prosecution instead ignores that this whole purpose of this rule is to promote confidence in the judiciary. This is not insignificant, okay? It is the entire consideration. It's not a question. Like if it's even close, you should boot the judge because that's the point is we want impartial judges, completely impartial. No system of justice can survive if its citizens lose faith in it, which is why we've been screaming here about what a catastrophe for indictments of your political opponents are because it's the legitimacy of the entire justice system is just evaporating every day. Because here they say, these proceedings are indeed historic. The public interest is not in the perception of a rush to judgment or a show trial contaminated by the appearance of a partial presiding judge, but in a fair proceeding, guaranteeing fundamental human and constitutional rights. Anything less will rightly call into question the very legitimacy of these proceedings and cause irreparable damage to 
our judicial system for generations to come. The public must have confidence that President Trump's constitutional rights are being protected by an unbiased judicial officer. No president is king, but every president is a United States citizen entitled to the protections and rights guaranteed by the U.S. Constitution. Therefore, Chutkin, this court, you, should overrule the government's objections and grant our motion and ensure the court is fully apprised on this crucial motion to make sure that you understand our position on this. President Trump respectfully requests a court schedule a hearing on this at the earliest opportunity. Outstanding motion, very thorough, and I think exactly what they needed to do. Reestablish the standard, reestablish the test. The test is not what the government said. The rule is about impartiality. We want to have unbiased judges. Otherwise, the system doesn't work. I don't think that they really care about that. They just want the conviction. They don't care if it's a legitimate conviction. They just want a conviction. But the whole takeaway on this is that Judge Chutkin has to review this. And they're saying that her statements are clearly disqualifying. She's the person who's going to make that decision. Sign off on here by John Loro, submitted into the DC court right in front of Judge Chutkin. And of course, that is going to be the final say on this. Judge Chutkin will come out. We'll get a ruling on that when it drops. I do hope you join us when it does as we continue to cover my friends. And thank you for liking this video, for sharing it with a friend, for checking out robertgovea.com, signing up for our daily newsletter, and we'll see you on the next one.